All right, yeah, I believe that is uh, recording. So yes, um, this session will be recorded. So uh, bear in mind that um, if you guys want to um, kind of raise your hands or say anything, uh, I'll be taking a recording of this and putting it on Blackboard. If uh, for any reason you kind of want to ask a question, but you want to remain anonymous, you can always just send me a direct message on Zoom, uh, and then I can just read out the question uh, without giving your name. Um, but yes, to recap, just because um, I wasn't recording when I said this, uh, this session is the last of the revision sessions. We'll be going through some previous exam questions. Uh, in particular, we'll be focusing on thermal control, but uh, we will also be touching on uh, power systems and on communications. So uh, as to how the session is going to actually work, uh, like I said, I'm going to be focusing on past exam papers. So you guys should all have access to the um, 2021 research paper and the 2018 exam paper. Uh, so I'll be focusing on those. And then if we have time afterwards, I'll go through some of the thermal quiz questions. And I'm going to save um, maybe five or 10 minutes at the end um, just to uh, let you guys ask any questions. If for whatever reason, uh, there's something that you want to know, there's something you're curious about, there's something you're not sure about, and for some reason I'm not able to, to cover it in this session, then uh, please ask on the Piazza forum. Um, we'll try and, and answer that kind of as quickly as we can. Obviously we know that your exam is coming up, so uh, we'll try our hardest to, to kind of be, be good about answering those questions. So yeah. Um, Oh, one more thing is um, if at any point you are not sure about something or you have a question, uh, please do ask. Um, ordinarily, I'd uh, ask you to raise your hands, but I'll be sharing my screen. And when I do that, sometimes it's a bit difficult for me to see if someone's raising their hands. So uh, try raising your hand. If that doesn't work, you can just unmute yourself and speak. I think that should work. If it gets a bit too rowdy, then I'll uh, reconsider that plan, but I believe. That should be fine. And uh, one final thing before we begin, I have been experiencing some minor technical difficulties uh, with um, with uh, the um, my setup. So there might be times where I'll have to stop sharing my uh, my video, um, my actual camera, and switch over to when I when I share my screen, just because my laptop's giving me some trouble. But uh, that shouldn't interfere with the session too much. So before we go any further, I have some questions in the chat. Um, can we cover the uplink downlink equations for comms at the end if we have time? I find the logs confusing. Yeah, we can uh, we can try and touch on that. Um, I think it will depend on how much time we have in the session. We don't have a massive amount of time, but um, yeah, I tell you what, I'll try and uh, try and touch on that as much as I can in the session. Like I said, if we don't cover that, please um, ask on the Piazza forum, and then I'll try and and kind of answer what exact questions you have before the end of the day, if possible. Uh, and if I can't, someone else will be able to. But uh, yeah, with that, uh, let's go ahead and start with the previous exam papers. So like I said, you guys should all have access to these exam papers. They're on Blackboard. Uh, I think we'll start with the 2021 research paper. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you guys can all see that. Uh, like I said, I'm going to stop my actual video while I share my screen because my laptop's been giving me some trouble. So. Okay, um, can everyone see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so yeah, you should all be able to see the 2021 uh, research exam paper. So I believe you guys will have already gone through, um, I think most of the questions uh, in this paper. Um, you've already gone through all the open plan papers, uh, questions rather. Um, yeah, so all of this. So I'm going to start with the uh, thermal control questions, which the first question is question 14. So yeah, to begin with, we're starting with question 14. 
uh, on the 2021 paper. You should all be able to see it because I'm sharing my screen. Uh, it is on Blackboard if you also want to get it up uh, separately. So question 14 is a fairly simple one. Uh, it's not really an equation one. It's more kind of just like testing your knowledge of the thermal systems. And it says, uh, which of the following elements does not need to be considered when calculating the thermal equilibrium of an Earth orbiting spacecraft? Um, so obviously, make sure you read the questions and things like this. It's what does not need to be considered. So let's go through it one by one and see which ones are important and which ones aren't. Uh, first one, direct solar radiation. This one is fairly obvious. Um, if we're considering the, the thermal equilibrium of a spacecraft, the direct radiation from the sun is important. So obviously, the sun is the source of most of the heat in, in our galaxy. So, you know, that's that's something that we always need to be considered. Um, B is the albedo radiation and C is the Earth shine. So both of these are sources of heat coming from the Earth. Uh, Earth is also kind of a major source of heat that needs to be considered. Um, if you're curious, the difference between the, the albedo radiation and the Earth shine is that albedo radiation is the sun's uh, radiation that's reflecting off the Earth, whereas the Earth shine is actually, you know, the temperature dissipates by the Earth itself. Um, so yeah, these are both things that need to be considered. And again, make sure you read the question carefully. Uh, this does say which of the following elements do not need to be considered. So even though in certain circumstances, the things like the earth shine or the albedo radiation will be significantly smaller than the direct solar radiation, we still need to be considered. We, need, we still need to consider them even if they will have uh, a negligible effect in some cases. And finally, the spacecraft onboard power dissipation. Uh, Again, this is something that always needs to be considered. Uh, a lot of satellites will have a PPU that will give off power. So we need to kind of think about how that will affect it. So A, B, C, D, and A, B, C, and D are all things that need to be considered. Therefore, the correct answer is E. We have to consider all of these. Fairly simple one. I find that these, uh, these kind of pick an option book learning ones are usually fairly simple. But uh, yeah, with that, we will now head over to uh, question 15. So this is a fairly a longer question that will involve kind of um, making a note of, of various uh, numbers. So I find with these, it's always, in, this is kind of a personal preference, but it helps me to kind of read through the question first and then make a note of all the important points in the question. So if you read through the question, um, a spacecraft is in a circular orbit around the sun, the same distance as Earth, which is 1 AU, but at a 90 degree separation from the Earth in true anomaly. Um, the spacecraft is equipped with a solar sail with an area of 25 meters by 25 meters. The thickness of the solar sail is assumed to be negligible. The spacecraft is three axis stabilized with the large surface area of the solar sail pointing towards the sun as shown in figure four. The solar sail is assumed to be isothermal, which is to say that it has the same temperature throughout, and no heat is transferred between the solar sail and the spacecraft. Assume that the spacecraft is so far from the Earth that no radiative heat or albedo can reach the spacecraft. The values for the solar absorptance and emittance for the solar sail, together with other thermophysical data, is given in Table 1. Uh, and then it gives us the stefan boltzmann constant. And then, yeah, we have... Um, the various environmental properties, and we have the absorptivity and the emissivity. Uh, and then also we have figure four, which is a nice little diagram um, that actually makes it, it a lot easier to visualize. Um, to be honest, I kind of prefer it when we don't have the uh, the diagram itself. It causes us to makes us draw our own little thing, which I find is a bit more fun. But yeah, it's an exam. So yeah, we have all of the information we need. So I think we can now go ahead and try and answer this question. So. If you bear with me for a second, I am going to try and switch over to a whiteboard so I can uh, answer this question a bit easier. So yeah, you should all now be able to see the whiteboard. Um, and... Um, yeah, what I usually like to do with questions like this is I like to um, 
make a note of all of the constants that we have. Um, just because I find that it helps when, when actually answering the question. So if we go back through the actual um, question, let's see what do we have. Uh, a spacecraft is in the circle, always about the sun. So the distance is one AU, 90 degree separation. So we know what the area of the satellite is. It is, so we have A equals 25 meters by 25 meters, which is 625 meters. 625 meters squared. Apologies for my bad handwriting for using a tablet, which I'm not used to using. 225 meters squared. Uh, now, again, this is a personal preference, but with exams, I always like to make a note of the units I'm using. I can't overstate how common it is for people to um, lose easy marks just because they use the wrong units at some point. And uh, it kind of causes the entire answer to be wrong. And this is something that happens at all levels of, of education. So again, at all points, I like to kind of always make note of the units. I always like to keep my units consistent. And this is a personal thing, but I like using base SI units just because it, uh, it makes it a bit easier to keep track of everything. Uh, but anyway, back to the question. So the uh, thickness of the solar sail is notable, three axis stabilized. What else do we have? So we have our Stefan Boltzmann constant. So Stefan Boltzmann is six point. Oh, sorry, no, that is incorrect. It is uh, five point six. Silly mistake there. Five point six seven e to the minus eight. Now, what else do we have? Uh, we got QS equals one four oh oh. Uh, what per meter squared? We have QE equals two forty. Squared. And we have the earth beta equals 0.3. We have the subtility 0.2 and emissivity equals 0.6. All right, so that's all the information we have from the question itself. And I usually find uh, having it written out like that makes things a bit easier uh, to solve. And again, like I said, everything is in uh, base SI units here, so it will make the actual calculations a little bit easier. So what are we looking for in this question? We are looking for the equilibrium temperature uh, of the solar sail. Now, what do we know about the, the equilibrium temperature? At the equilibrium temperature, we know that... Heat in is equal can... to heat out. So you can say that again? The heat energy transferred in is equal to that transferred out. Exactly, exactly. That is completely correct. So Q in equals Q out. And uh, just give me a second to make sure my volume is up. I didn't realize I had you guys uh, so quiet. All right, there we are. So Q in equals Q out. And uh, this is actually quite a nice exam because um, the previous question kind of tells us what the things we need to consider for Q in are. So the things that are the Q in are, we have the uh, direct solar radiation, which I'm going to call QS. We have the albedo radiation, which I'm going to call QA. We have the earth shine, which I am uh, called QE for earth. And we have the onboard power dissipation, which I'll call Q, uh, not QP, power dissipation. And those are, sources in, and then the source out will just call Q uh, loss. Now, if we go through and we read the actual question, it tells us that the satellite is far enough away from the Earth 
that uh, the earth isn't going to be, uh, it, it's going to have no potential effect on the thermal situation. So already we know that QA and QE we can basically treat as zero. Um, it also tells us to do, 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 do. the solar sail, um, no heat is transferred between the solar sail and the spacecraft. So that the onboard power dissipation is functionally going to be zero because none of the, the heat from the spacecraft is going to reach the solar sail. So effectively, what we have here is QS equals Q loss, which, um, yeah, it's, it's a fairly kind of uh, nice, easy, straightforward question, really. Um, the equation for QS we can get from the notes, and that is um, multiplied by the density, multiplied by the area. And the equation for Q loss we can also uh, get from the notes, and that is uh, multiplied by Stefan Boltzmann, multiplied by the equilibrium temperature over four, multiplied by the area. So here we have an equation where um, we know most of the, the, the kind of parameters in it. So if we go through step-by-step, step, we know the, the solar radiation flux, uh, we know the uh, absorptivity, we know what the area is, uh, we know what the emissivity is, we know what the Stefan Boltzmann is, we know what the area is again, uh, we just don't know the temperature. So we have an equation where there's only one thing we don't know, which, so it's fairly simple to solve, therefore. Um, if anything, this question gave us more information than we need because we actually don't need the, the area to solve this equation because that will, they'll like cancel out. We've got an area on the left-hand side and an area on the right-hand side. So, um, yeah, it, in that case, we can kind of rearrange the equation where, uh, so it's t to the power of four, so t will equal, four, uh, let's see, t over that, and that. And again, we have all of these values, so we can just plug everything into our calculators fairly simple, and let's see what result we get. Oh, and then if one of you guys uh, want to also do this in your calculators, just to give me a sanity check, make sure I don't plug it, push any wrong buttons. Okay, I am getting a value of 301.2 Kelvin. Did you guys also get that? Oh, sorry, I, I didn't hear that if someone asked the question. Oh. Well, I'm going to assume that that's the correct answer, and then people can correct me if you put this into your calculator and got an incorrect answer. But um, Oh, someone put something to the chat. Yeah, someone else got 301.2. Perfect. All right. So, yeah, and uh, what I like to do just as kind of a uh, sanity check is if we convert that from Kelvin to Celsius, uh, it could be a bit embarrassing with the internet to do some strong. Yeah. So that is... Uh, that works out to roughly... Twenty-seven degrees Celsius, which um, kind of makes sense. That's a number that you'd expect. Uh, something that's this distance from the sun being exposed to the sun to get. Um, Sir, I this is an old. It's around twenty-eight point oh five. Uh, Celsius. Twenty-eight point five Celsius. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, um, what I like to do with, with exam questions like this is I like to um, kind of think about what numbers are expected just as a little bit of a sanity check as to whether it's correct or incorrect. Um, 
because yeah if you if you get if you do a question like this and you get an answer of like you know minus 200 degrees celsius um you can just be like well it's exposed to the sun it shouldn't be minus 200 degrees celsius and then if you get an answer of like you know a million degrees you can be like well that's not a reasonable you know if you get like 10 to the 8 degrees or something like that you can be like that's not a reasonable thing so usually i find with um with exam questions like this it's nice to give yourself a little bit of science check and kind of think logically does this answer make sense does it not because it's a good way to kind of tell if you're on the right track with your with your answers but um yeah, in general, I, I personally thought that was a, a fairly simple question just because it uh, it let us kind of eliminate a lot of the, the parameters right out of the gate. So we were kind of only dealing with this one uh, source of heat and the source of loss. But uh, yeah, if if that makes sense to everyone, does anyone have any questions about that specific question or shall we move on to the next one? All right. I'm going to go ahead and clear this. Uh, you guys can take a screenshot if you want, but like I said, this is uh, being recorded. It will be on Blackboard uh, basically as soon as the session is done, if you guys want to come back and have a look at this. So I'm going to go ahead and clear all drawings. And let's uh, head on to the next question. Back to the exam paper. So it was the thumb question. The next question is a uh, power supply question. So um, let's see. That is question 16. A spacecraft is in a circular orbit with an altitude h of 800 kilometers around Earth on the Sun-Earth plane. The power budget requires 100 watts of power during the day and 50 watts of power during eclipse. The batteries have a specific energy density of 10, uh, you know, WHKG and a depth of discharge UD of 40% and efficiency of 0.85. Assume the spacecraft has a solar array that provides sufficient power to power the spacecraft and charge the battery when illuminated day. Assume Earth's gravitational parameter and then yeah, it's just some, some physical constants. All right, so this is quite a nice question because um, Actually, I'm going to switch over right now while I still have this uh, being shared with you. If you go to your course notes, there's basically an entire page uh, just dedicated to answering questions like this. Uh, which, let's see if we can find it. Yeah, there's basically an entire page uh, dedicated to what power system sizing, which uh, is quite nice. So it'll make questions like this fairly easy to uh, to answer if it comes up because it kind of has a step-by-step -step guide to want it. But uh, yeah, why don't we go ahead and uh, try and answer this question similar to how we answered the previous question. So let me switch back to my whiteboard. Sir? Uh, yeah? I know, I'm sorry if I'm embarrassing myself, and I know I've asked this question to at least one person before, but I just wanted to get it double checked. I heard that while yes. we are allowed to bring in an A4 side of handwritten notes, we're not yes. allowed to bring in an A4 side of printed notes. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, it is. Wait, so um, nothing printed, it's... all handwritten. It has to be handwritten, yeah. Um, which, to be honest, I, I, I'm not 100% clear as to the justification for the rule, but personally, I find it easier if it's handwritten, um, just because I find that if you sit down and you actually write out all the equations you need, it makes it a bit easier for you to remember exactly where each thing is. It's a bit easier for you to refer to things. Um, and also, I find that if you handwrite stuff, it's a bit easier to kind of fit everything onto one A4 sheet. But uh, yeah, no, don't be embarrassed. It's a perfectly valid question. And uh, I always say there's no bad questions to ask because the whole point of the session is for you guys to ask questions and pick stuff out. But uh, yeah, does that clear it up? Yes, it is clear. Thank you. All right, no problem. But yeah, um, so where was I? Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's let's do the same thing we did uh, last time, where we kind of go through it uh, 
step by step and we, we answer the question. So a spacecraft is in a circular orbit with an altitude H of 800 kilometers, which is 100 meters. And remember what I said, I, I find it a lot easier to have things in base SI units because you know then that everything will, uh, will kind of match up um, with each other. So the power budget requires 100 watts of power during the day and 50 watts of power during the eclipse. Now, this is um, something that can trip you up in exam questions. Not all of the information will be relevant. Um, so we have the, the, the power requirements during the day and we have the power requirements during eclipse. But this question is solely focusing on the batteries. And the question does say, uh, assume that the spacecraft has a solar array that can power the spacecraft during the day and also charge the batteries. So we're not looking at anything during the day. We're just looking at the eclipse because that's when the batteries are going to be used. So the, the relevant power, and I'll just call it power eclipse, just even though we are looking at that one, is uh, 50 watts. The specific energy density is 10. And the yeah, uh, is 40%. And the efficiency is 0 0.85. Uh, assume the spacecraft and blah, 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 blah. and yeah, then it's all the the regular kind of parameters that we'll we'll need. Actually, I feel like enough things are in kilometers that I'm just going to use H in, uh, in kilometers for now. But yeah, with that, we can answer the actual question itself. So let's see, I'm probably going to be switching between the... Uh... Give me a second. I'm just switching back to the page notes that had the exact step by step. That so was very, very useful. So, uh, yeah, if you guys get your notes up and you kind of look at, at the step by step guide, it says the very first thing we need is the orbital period. Uh, orbital period, nice and simple to calculate, but uh, we do need the semi major axis. Um, this is another thing that is a very, very common mistake is people getting confused between the altitude and the semi-major axis um, or, you know, the uh, the orbital radius. There's a, a very here. important difference. Sorry? Wait, so radius is equal to planet radius plus altitude, right? Exactly, yes, 100%. And now Always we're doing remember a circular orbit. Yeah. And as we're doing a circular so, orbit, means, sorry. So if it's a circular orbit, it means that the radius and the same major axis are the same. Yes. So it, it's nice and easy because it's a circular orbit. Um, but even if it's uh, an eccentric orbit, it's fairly simple to calculate the same major axis. But yeah, I I, I think I'd, I'd like to state this because I think it's a very, very common mistake I see just because I think sometimes people forget about it. But as long as you can keep it in your head, it's a very easy mistake to avoid. So please, please, please remember this when exam time comes around. But for now, um, like you said, it's it's a uh, it's a circular orbit. So um, the the semi major axis is just going to be the radius of the Earth plus the altitude. Um, then I'll just do control calculations. It's uh, 
Uh, seven, seven, one. And then we have, we can use that to calculate the orbital period. Uh, this is the equation for the orbital period is a very important equation. It's uh, in your notes. Definitely make sure that this is one of the equations that you put on your, your little crib sheets that you're taking with you because it's one that you definitely are, are going to use. It's a very important equation. So yeah, we can use that to calculate the um, the, uh, the period. Um, and after this, I'm just going to go and have a open up model answers and see what the answer is. Uh, uh, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Great, six, eight. Oh, this, all right. So if we go back to the notes, it says that the next thing we need is the maximum time in eclipse. Again, remember that um, these metrics are just being used during eclipse. So uh, we want to calculate what the maximum time in eclipse is. And um, the, the notes just have a nice little equation that we can use without having to um, uh, do anything to complicate it. Well, firstly, um, though, let me switch back to, to the actual notes and show you guys this because that will make it a little bit easier to, to explain. So we need to find the, the maximum time given in eclipse, but to get the maximum time given in eclipse, we need the angle that uh, it's going to be in eclipse for. And rather than uh, looking at this equation, I find it a lot easier to just look at this uh, little figure here, figure 2.7, uh, sorry, 7.21. Uh, so this is the angle that we're looking for, and I believe I put uh, a similar little calculation in the, uh, the math coursework that you did, but uh, we're looking for this angle here, which um, if you think about it, we know what the radius of the Earth is, and we know what the height of the orbit is, so it's a pretty simple uh, Bit of um, bit of geometry to do here, so we have uh, R E, and let me uh, let me annotate this. So we have R E here, that's R E H. So it basically just cause of this angle is going to be R E over. Um, R E H. So, yeah, just just using kind of Sokoto, we can solve this uh, fairly easily. I, I might have said it incorrectly, actually, when I think about it, but yeah, Sokoto is fairly simple. Um, I'm trying to go through this kind of quickly because I just know the time and knows that we are uh, uh, going through the session uh, a bit slower than we probably should. But uh, yeah, it's a fairly simple one to calculate. And then we go back to our whiteboard. Sir, not to be oh, yeah. a rude twist, but am I allowed? To, but just in case we don't cover uplink and downlink, I just want to know. So uplink and downlink work just the same as each other, except you are going from, except you are switching the role of transmitter and receiver, right? Uh, effectively, yeah. Wait, effectively, what's the difference? Uh, basically, yeah, is, is what I'm saying, yeah. But yeah, I'll let me, let me go, get through this question first, just so I don't lose my train of thought. But uh, you wish you will. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like you kind of have that understanding of it. Yeah. Um, where was I? Yeah. So so basically, to get that angle, it's comes. Degrees. And then we can just plug that into that equation that was given in the notes to get the time in eclipse, which is 180 degrees minus two, and all over 316 degrees. What's quite boring. Yeah. Which is uh, kind of a fairly simple equation. It's just using degrees and radians to get percentage of time. 
based in eclipse and multiplying by the orbital period. Uh, but that gives us that the time eclipse is 0.585 hours. All right, and then we need the uh, actual energy density. So this one is one where, um, if you guys didn't hear about this, it might confuse you a little bit, because if we go to the uh, course notes that I was just using as a nice example, um, the actual equation isn't given. But uh, if we then switch over to, uh, I actually opened this up beforehand, so that might be confusing. If you switch over to the, um, the actual lecture slides, it does give you that uh, the actual equation we need. So that's why that might be a little confusing. But yeah, if you are doing revision over the weekend and you're not sure where the equation is, just switch over to the lecture slides. It'll make things a little easy for you. But yeah, the actual equation for the energy is so P E T E D, and then we uh, multiply that by the efficiency. And that gives us 6 hours. And yeah, the notes tell us that if we have the, uh, the energy density and the specific energy density, it's quite easy to get the mass because we just have to divide one by the other. And that should give us a mass of 8.6 kilograms. All right, and that is that question. So unless anyone has any questions about that, I'm just going to go ahead and head over to the communication section, because I know that's something that people often have uh, a bit of uh, uncertainty towards. All right. So I'm going to stop this. And let's screen share back to the actual exam question. Uh, so um, regarding the actual communication, like I said, I know people can get quite stressed out about it. I know it can be a little bit intimidating. I, I think in general, don't worry too much uh, about it. It's the kind of thing that I understand why you can be intimidated about it. But if you kind of take your time, read through the questions carefully, uh, it shouldn't be too bad, especially because bear in mind, the uh, I've not actually read through the, the exam, but uh, usually the exam questions aren't as complicated as the kind of questions we throw at you in the, uh, the MATLAB tutorial or even in the, the tutorial quizzes. So if you were able to answer that quickly, which I'm assuming you were just based on kind of like the, the distribution of marks in, uh, in in those tutorials, like if you were able to answer those competently, you should be fine in the exam. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and, uh, and um, answer the, the communication questions. Uh, first question is similar to that the, uh, the sources of energy question is which of these is not a potential source of noise for a communication system? Uh, first one is albedo radiation, which, yeah, al albedo radiation isn't going to have uh, an effect on, on communication systems. It's the kind of thing that will have an effect on thermal, but the, um, the, the strength of the, the reflection of the earth isn't strong enough to, to affect a communication system. So, yeah, it's going to be that one. All the other ones are stuff that, like your notes, will will explain why they're used. But albedo radiation will not have it's on our communication system. So let's head over and answer the the actual question. Uh, well, the actual like, calculation question. Um, a small satellite is at an altitude h of five hundred kilometers in a circular orbit around the Earth. Uh, the wavelength of the signal used for the downlink. Uh, is 0.2 meters. Assume that uh, gives us the radius of the Earth. It gives us the uh, the speed of light, electromagnetic radiation in the vacuum. Uh, calculate the frequency f in megahertz to two significant figures, and free space loss in decibels to three significant figures uh, due to the distance between the ground station and the satellite when the satellite is directly overhead. 
All right. So um, it's quite a nice question, I think, just because there's not that many things for us to consider. I feel like it's a bit easier to kind of keep things uh, lined up in uh, in your head. So um, I just noticed that there's a question in the chat. I'll I'll get to it kind of after I uh, I answer this question because this question should take too much time. So I'm not ignoring it. I'm just going to get back to it a bit. Uh, all right, let's head back to the whiteboard. And yeah, I'm going to go ahead and clear all of this. You can take a screenshot if you want, but if not, it's it's all going to be on uh, on Blackboard pretty soon anyway. So let's go ahead and answer this question. So a small satellite is at an altitude h of 500 kilometers. So h equals 500 kilometers, which equals 500, 1, 2, 3 meters. Um, the wavelength is 0.2. Meters and the radius of the earth goes six three seven one. Um, that means for the answer, I don't know if that's a meter actually. Six seven three seven one. Kilometers and yeah, speed of uh, EM radiation is the V8 second to the minus one. And we are looking for the frequency and the free space loss. So, firstly, the frequency this is kind of a nice, easy question. So, I think. Let's hope you get uh, a question like this in, in this year's exam. Frequency is fairly simple to calculate. Basically, we have the, the wavelength. Uh, we know what the speed of radiation is, so we can just calculate the frequency. Frequency equals uh, speed of light over the wavelength. Um, I keep calling it the speed of light because that's the layman's term, but the proper term is the speed of electromagnetic radiation in a vacuum. Wouldn't blame and, you. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's one of these things where you, you, like people say it, you probably shouldn't say it in a very fancy engineering context, but people say it. Uh, so three times 10 to the eight over uh, the two. That gives us, let's see, 1.5 times 10 to the, let's count on the zeros, one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times ten to the nine hertz, and yeah, you could put that into megahertz or whatever if you wanted to. But let's just uh, leave it like that for simplicity's sake. So that's the frequency done. That's basically half the the question done already, just by by popping that equation in. The next one is slightly more complicated, but not too much. Uh, we can calculate the free space loss. So. L S equals, and I can't remember this equation off the top of my head. So give me a second while I uh, have a look in the notes. Apologies for this before I should have gotten this up before the session started. There it is. All right. Um, so the free space loss is four pi s oh, that's square right. So the free space loss is the equation for it is let's see four pi s over that square. But now this is where it gets tricky. That's the equation for free space loss. But the question says it wants the free space loss in decibels to three significant figures. So, something in decibels is equal to 10 multiplied by log base 10 of the something we want to decibelize, right? 
Exactly. But also, because it is squared, remember... Fonti that log a of 4, S, S, 4 pi s over, pi over lambda. Yes, exactly. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just like second remember. So, because we are working in decibel, oh, oh no, I stopped screen sharing. How do I? Oh, sorry about that. Damn. So, because it is in logs instead, it will be 20 log. Uh, I s over the wavelength. Okay, so we know what wavelength is. Uh, we don't know what s is. Uh, luckily, we do know what s we... is. It's the altitude. Oh no, we do. Yes, of course. Sorry about that. And then it's, it's just punching stuff into a calculator. Exactly. Yeah. Nice, easy one. Um, yeah, that's why it's good to kind of make sure you're using the right, uh, terms for things before you, you start it. So that's, I should say. Yes. And then, yeah, we plug everything in and what do we get? 20 times log times I. Over the wavelength is 0.2. And let's see, it is through to three significant figures. So that is one, four, nine. Um, that's 150, basically. But yeah, it's. Um, Yeah, so that's a fairly simple question as well. The only kind of, oh, I don't know why I accidentally erased the, the O in, in log. But yeah, that's a fairly simple question as well. I think, again, the only tricky thing here is just make sure you know how decibels work before you go into the exam, because that's the kind of thing that can trip you out. It can kind of cost you a few marks, but uh, it's the kind of thing where if you spend a little bit of time just making sure you understand before, you can just avoid any um unfortunate uh, mistakes there so that is everything with the 20 uh 20 uh one paper um, i'm gonna go ahead and start sharing your video now because i don't think zoom will start complaining i've stopped sharing my screen all right yeah perfect zoom isn't complaining um yeah that actually took longer than i thought um i didn't uh, i thought we'd be able to get through at least two exam papers today but uh that is it for now um, before we go any further, there were some questions in the chat that I, um, yeah, so we have a question about how to convert logs for decibels and someone explained it quite nicely. Um, the question is, no, it's, it's a, it's a valid answer. Um, but, uh, yeah. And then just remember that if it's something squared, that um, then you'll basically multiply it rather than, than squaring it how you usually would. It's basically um, the loss of log through school, right? Basically, yeah. Um, and then another question in, we have is, what if it's a print of handwritten notes? That is a good question. Uh, that is a question that has been asked before and one of the other GTAs is trying to find an answer to that. Um, I believe the, the, the answer that was given was it should be fine. I think someone was, was following up with Kate just to be sure, but, um, yeah, I think for now, assume it should be fine, but we are just going to double check. And then if it turns out it's not fine, we'll send out an email or post on the, on the forum or, or something like that. So just keep an eye out, but for now, assume it, it should be fine. But completely um, printed notes, but completely printed notes that you, including stuff taken from the presentations and placed onto a separate paper that is printed out is a no-go, right? Yeah, exactly. So you cannot type out notes. You cannot have like screenshots of things. It has to be handwritten. Um, 
I, I think, well, also, I'm, I'm slightly interpreting this question based on, but like what the, the other person asked was he has a, uh, he has a writing tablet, similar to the tablet I've been using for this session, except presumably his handwriting is neater than mine. Um, and he basically like wrote out all of these things just on his tablet and then printed them out. And he just wants to double check that should be fine, that that would be fine. Um, and yeah, I, I assume it would be fine. It is basically the same as just using a, a pen to write notes out. You're just like using a different medium. You know, there's no rule that says it has to be pen or it has to be pencil or whatever. So uh, I would assume that would be fine. But again, keep an eye out. We'll let you know if it turns out it's not fine. Um, I need to see what Kate says. I'm going to ask her. But um, I don't see any reason why it should be an issue. Um, OK, we have three more minutes. Does anyone have any further questions? Um, Again, bearing in mind that if, if if there is something that I didn't have a chance to get through, a Piazza forum is still going to be open. So that's also an option. Thank you very much for today's lesson, sir. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, I don't see any other questions. So yeah, before before we we, we finish, um, good luck with the exam. Thanks. Don't stress too much about it. Um, I know it's scary, and I know. Um, Especially because I, I think this is your first, um, I might be incorrect about this, but I think this is your first course kind of dealing with space and satellites and things. So it can be a little bit intimidating. But um, honestly, it's the kind of exam where if if you kind of stay calm, you read through the question carefully, um, do what I did, write out everything you know, write out every step in your calculation, uh, you should be fine. Especially if you do that, because you will get partial marks if you... Um, like if you have like these questions where there was like a bunch of different equations and if you write them all out, you you explain things. Um, oh, okay. No, apparently I was incorrect. Uh, Kate said that you probably can't um, do handwritten notes if it's on a tablet um, because you can adjust the size of the writing and she doesn't want to squeeze everything on it. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, in that case, I apologize for giving you incorrect information, but... Uh, Kate says that no, you you should just write it on uh, on paper with a pen. So you know, sorry if you've already written out uh, a page of notes on an iPad. But again, it is nice just to to write this all out by hand because it kind of um, like cements it in your brain a bit better. It makes it a bit easier for you to kind of you know when you're writing the exam and you see something that calls for an equation to be like, oh, I know this equation. That's this equation that I wrote over here. I just kind of pulled out. Um, so yeah, that's basically that. Good luck. Don't stress. Remember, take a few deep breaths before you start. Um, and yeah, I, I've got my fingers crossed for you guys, but I'm sure you'll all do okay. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, end the session now, but, uh, yeah, hope you have a good weekend and, uh, hope you have a good exam period. Bye.